Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, want to appreciate uh, everyone for joining for today's uh, joint hearing of the 2021 operating budgets for the Public Utilities, Neighborhood, and Technology Committees. Uh, before we begin, I just want to thank everyone for their preparation for today's hearing. Um, Deprepper, Director, or Department of Public Utilities Assistant Director John Lee, I appreciate you being here uh, representing uh, the Department of Public Utilities. Uh, from the Department of Neighborhoods, we have Director Carly William Scott, uh, Director Todd Diefendorfer, uh, Assistant Director Julia Carter, thank you for joining us. And from the Department of Technology, we have Director uh, Sam Orth, as well as I believe uh, Deputy Director Pam O'Grady will be here, uh, and some other folks from the department potentially as well. Uh, I wanna thank uh, my colleagues on council um, for supporting and doing their other council uh, budget hearings to make sure the public is informed about the up upcoming 2022 um, City of Columbus operating budget. Uh, our council staff, CTV, and certainly members of the public that have taken time uh, out of their day to either tune in or be here with us in council chambers. Um, the purpose of, tonight, of tonight's hearing is to review and comment on the mayor's proposed 2022 operating budget uh, for the departments I mentioned earlier. Uh, as well as for them to detail some of the key initiatives for the coming year and the um, cost of those initiatives. Uh, this hearing is available to live stream on CTV, uh, Council's Facebook page, YouTube page, and broadcast on Spectrum Channel 1024, WOW Channel 3, and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. Uh, the video of this hearing will also be posted on the City of Columbus uh, Council YouTube page following this event. Uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to Public Utilities Assistant Director John Lee for that department's presentation. Assistant Director Lee. Good evening, Chairman Dormans, Dorans and members of City Council. Thank you for allowing me to present the Department of Public Utilities 2022 operating budget. The department's total budget for 2022 totals $715 million and is a 4.3% increase above our 2021 budget. <clears throat> Our budget provides funding for four divisions, our water, sewers and drains, stormwater, and power divisions. It also includes funding for our director's office. The budget includes funding for 1,312 full-time employees and 47 part-time personnel. Our 2022 budget is largely a continuation budget. These budgeted dollars will allow us to continue to fulfill our mission of providing essential utility services to residents and businesses in the Columbus region. I will highlight each division's budget in some areas where we're budgeting increased costs, largely driven by market price increases, supply chain delays, and increased debt service costs. For our director's office budget, the total is 34.9 million and is a 1.6% increase above the 2021 budget. This office is supported by an allocation percentage from each of the divisions. It provides the overall direction and strategy for the department and includes several sections, including fiscal, human resources, regulatory compliance, emergency preparedness, and some other sections. Personnel is the largest expense for the director's office, coming in at 65% of the total budget. In 2022, we budgeted for 239 full-time personnel and eight part-time personnel. Approximately 60% of our budgeted personnel costs are targeted to our customer service section, which has 141 positions budgeted. During 2022, we will continue to allocate funding for our customer service center to improve service levels and help answer billing related calls and offer assistance to customers applying for our CARES payment relief program and our small business relief program, as well as our low income and senior discount programs. The director's office budget also includes 3.5 million for a new work asset management software system that will assist the department in managing daily work orders, preventive maintenance schedules on equipment and inventory. Our stormwater division provides effective stormwater collection services to the community within the corporate limits of Columbus. Overall, the 2022 stormwater budget totals 47 million and is 3.2% higher than the 2021 budget. The stormwater budget includes funding for 26 full-time personnel and two part-time positions. Of the total budget, 66% supports operating and maintenance costs and 34% goes towards debt service. Our stormwater capital program is increasing and we are dedicating additional dollars to help mitigate street and yard flooding and improve overall drainage in neighborhoods and around downtown. Debt service from the operating fund will pay the principal and interest 
on the bonds and loans funding these projects. Over 55% of the stormwater budget, or 26 million, funds payments to the Department of Public Service for street cleaning services and to the Division of Sewers and Drains for engineering services. Budgeted personnel at 2.6 million will allow us to maintain our commitment to EPA to increase our compliance prevention of harmful pollutants from being washed into storm sewers and local rivers. Our Division of Water's total budget is 241 million and is 7.8% above the 2021 budget. Operations and maintenance expenses are increasing 11.3% while debt service is increasing 4%. Debt service expenses covered the annual principal and interest payments used for bond and debt and loan payments for our capital improvement projects. These debt service costs are largely for existing projects that, we've, uh, that have been issued in the past few years, specifically to cover the major improvements that we've done at our water plants, as well as water line rehab projects in neighborhoods. The 2022 budget will support a total of 467 full-time positions, and water's largest budget increases are in materials and supplies and services, with increases of 14 and 19% respectively, compared to the 2021 budget. The drivers for the increase in the services line are 1.35 million for our enhanced meter program, 1.4 million for contracted meter reading services, and 11.45 million for managing residuals at our water treatment plants. Materials and supplies are budgeted higher due to uh, cost increases, largely in the chemical cost area. Chemical costs for 2022 total 17.3 million and are budgeted 7.5% higher than 2021. Our general supplies for water have also increased 7.7% .7 for 2022. Our treatment process consumes a lot of electricity as well, and electricity costs are budgeted higher at 6% above 2021 levels. Our Division of Sewers and Drains budget is $326 million and is 1.9% higher than 2021. Operations and maintenance expenses are budgeted less than 2021 levels with a reduction of 0.29%. Debt service costs are increasing above the 2021 budget by 3.2%. Overall, Sewers and Drains total budget, 37% goes towards operations and 63% goes for debt service. Like water, the debt service is used to pay back the principal and interest on bonds and loans we use to support our capital program, which is largely driven by EPA regulatory requirements and our consent order. In 2022, Blueprint Columbus will continue in neighborhoods to eliminate the source of sewer overflows and basement backups. We are focused on eliminating water and basement backups and remedying complaints by preventing sewer overflows. Our operating budget provides an additional $666,000 for our Project Dry Basement Program, where residents can have a backflow device installed to eliminate basement backups. In 2021, Council approved $1.5 million for this program and will continue to draw down those dollars during 2022 as well. Capital equipment is increasing for sewers and drains in 2022. There was a lot of deferments in 2021 with equipment to reduce the budget. It's increasing about 25% above 2021 levels. This capital equipment includes pump station upgrades, high service pumps, and heavy duty and light duty vehicles. Finally, our Division of Powers budget is set at 99 million and is 5.5% higher than 2021. The large increases is due to our purchase power cost increases, increase in the use of our service contracts for new service connections and repairs, and additional capital outlay for needed equipment as well as additional debt service compared to prior years. Budgeted purchase power costs are increasing 3.7% above 2021 budgeted levels due to rising capacity and transmission costs, which are passed through costs related to our, our wholesale purchase power contract. Interest costs are also increasing about 65% to cover payments for bond sale dollars the division received uh, early this year. These bond dollars will be used to maintain and improve our distribution system and install and upgrade streetlights to smart streetlights throughout our system. Council Member Dorans and members of City Council, thank you again for the opportunity to summarize the Department of Public Utilities 2022 operating budget, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.
Thank you, uh, Assistant Director Lee. Uh, we did not receive any speaker slips uh, this evening for any public questions to the Department of Public Utilities. Uh, so we will move on to uh, a couple that I have, okay. if, if that's okay. Um, I know we've talked, uh, we've had a number of ordinances come before council here of late, um, either for modifications or uh, for in increase for purchases of supplies, other types of things uh, due to supply chain issues that people in the economy right now are experiencing uh, for a variety of reasons. I um, wonder if you could comment from a Department of Public Utilities standpoint how that's impacting this 2022 budget. We've seen a lot, Chairman Dorman's members of, uh, of City Council, we've seen a lot of issues related to price increases and supply chain issues. Um, largely for a 2022 budget, we are increasing, as, as noted, a lot of our materials and supplies. Um, that's really where we're seeing uh, the largest impact. Um, notably, our purchase power increases, as I mentioned, the transmission and, co and capacity cost increases. A lot of those are driven by outside uh, entities and are really outside of our control. Um, we've seen prices, as mentioned, in the chemical area. Uh, we use a lot of chemicals in our treatment process, not only for water, but for sewer as well. And we've seen liquid chlorine, for example, uh, we've seen that price per ton double. And so we've had to increase quite a bit our chemical budget just just because of those price increases. And they are allowed to do that. That's acceptable per their contract. And so we have to prepare for that in our budget. Um, we've seen construction material price increase and commodity price increases as well uh, on our construction side and our construction budgets. Um, and, and that has resulted in increased bid amounts. So overall, um, we've I would say that we've seen a large increase since this summer to now. And so we've had to make some last minute adjustments, uh, not only to our 2022 budget um, here in the third quarter of, in the fourth quarter of 2021. Thank you. Um, and I know when we um, had a public hearing a few weeks ago about the utility rate adjustments that this, uh, the department proposed and council passed, um, there were some pretty big drivers the past couple of years. Um, most folks may or may not understand that, you know, the department is enterprise funded, which is a fancy way of saying uh, people pay their water and sewer bill. And that's the way that the vast majority of the funding for the department, you know, arrives to you all to do, to do the things that you do. Um, but we've seen the last two years, obviously, a significant change in, in how that happens, right? So we've had thousands of people um, have economic problems with, within and not be able to, to pay their bills. And also we've seen a decrease in consumption in water as um, fewer uh, people are working downtown and other, and other job centers. That has significantly impacted you know, the department's budget um, and how that translates moving forward. So I wanted to uh, ask you just to, to sort of comment on uh, how, that's, how, how the department has handled that and how that's translated into um, you all tackling sort of the, the costs um, for, for this budget period moving forward. Great question, Council Member Dorans. Uh, members of Council, uh, in 2020, as we entered into the pandemic, one thing that we did was we postponed our water shutoffs um, just to provide relief for our customers, residential and, and commercial customers. And that resulted, we've seen some uh, a rising level of delinquencies. So that's been something we've been managing from a um, cash flow standpoint uh, and monitoring that. But what we did was we received some CARES dollars. Uh, we received some an allocation of those dollars and we developed a utility billing assistance program just for uh, residential uh, customers and so far we've we've given out a total of 1.5 million in, in relief and customers can still apply that that program is still available uh, they can go on our website it's pretty easy to find the application go there and apply and get some relief for any outstanding bills um, we recently established a small business utility assistance program uh, of 1.5 million dollars where small businesses can apply. There's some application requirements there. It's a brand new program with about $1.5 million. So both of those will continue in 2022. Uh, uh, as mentioned, our customer service center, um, we have dollars there for staffing to take those calls uh, and resources available to continue those programs and provide that relief. We're also continuing our, our low income and senior program as well. Uh, that has not changed. 
Uh, thank you, Assistant Director. And, and again, just want to compliment the department on, you know, in the early days of the pandemic, it was very, very quickly folks realized that, you know, we had to um, move towards discontinuing any utility shutoffs because of the situation that people were going to be in um, and the, the work that's happened internally to make sure that the assistance programs have been up and running. And, you know, literally the customer service center actually calling individual customers that are behind in their bill and saying, do you need help? We have dollars to help them. That has been a monumental undertaking, as I understand, and um, certainly has been well appreciated that uh, the department has been very, very proactive about making sure that they're doing everything they can to help folks that are in, in a tough position. So uh, please pass along our council's thanks to certainly the, the leadership, but also the, the folks who are literally making those phone calls every single day to try and get people to, to take, get, take advantage of that assistance. Um, so just a couple of other questions uh, as it you know, relates to um, the you know, various different construction programs that the department has. Um, you're constantly looking forward um, to how we serve residents here here in Columbus. Uh, could you just comment on, you know, we've talked a lot about the growth that Columbus is experiencing and that um, specifically translates to whether or not we have the water and sewer infrastructure in order to promote and absorb that growth. Um, you know, we're wanted to just give an opportunity for the department to, as it translates to a budget matter, um, how, how the department's thinking through, you know, not only this budget, um, but sort of in, in years moving forward, how, how you all are approaching that from a budgetary standpoint. Councilmember Dorans, uh, members of council, uh, I would say that one approach that we've been taking is really looking at capacity and looking at the growing region and how, how to address that capacity. Um, one area, would be uh, as we move into 2022, we're gonna be looking at a fourth water plant. You know, we've got uh, three water plants now, but again, uh, the region is growing and having that capacity not only to serve uh, existing customers, growing customers, um, as well as businesses that need that additional capacity. So we're looking at that, but we're also um, expanding on our uh, sewer side as well. We've completed, um, an expansion project in the last year there to added additional treatment capacity. The debt service in the 2022 budget will help cover um, part of that, that repayment stream. Um, and also we're engaged with a new deep tunnel here uh, in the downtown area, which is again, again going to uh, add capacity to capture those combined sewer overflows. Uh, and we're also integrating a lot of technology uh, with our advanced meter program, that's something that we're going to be rolling out, uh, you know, in the in the coming years here. That that's one area I failed to mention where we're actually receiving uh, or, or seeing a shortage, particularly with our chips. Uh, that's part of the those water meters receive chips, so we have a supply chain um, delay there. So we're working on that, but some some more technology technology advancements to improve our services. Thank you. And I know a lot of those those things are related to the capital budget um, and those kind of things. I know we're here today to talk, talk about the operating, but you can't sort of separate those two things when we're talking about, uh, you know, the Department of Public Utilities, which, you know, you have to have the people to uh, to, to be able to uh, operate and, and do the work, but also at the same time, you have to have literally the, the actual physical infrastructure as well. So I appreciate you um, commenting on sort of how both of those budgets are interplay and to do the work that the Department of Public Utilities does, so thank you for that. Um, those are all the, all the questions I have for you, Assistant Director Lee. I uh, appreciate your, your presentation. Um, if we do receive any questions from the members of the public, we'll be sure to uh, submit those and make sure that um, folks are aware and that we get answers back to, to um, community members that may have questions about your proposed budget. So thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to turn to the uh, Neighborhoods Committee. Um, we have here uh, with us tonight um, a variety of folks from the Department of uh, Neighborhoods, and I would like to turn the, uh, the floor over to uh, Director Carla William Scott. Director? Good evening, Councilmember Dorans. Um, thank you again for giving us, allowing us this opportunity to share with you our proposed 2022 department budget. I would also like to thank Mayor Genther Finance Director Joe Lombardi um, and, um, and his team. And last but certainly not least, I don't know why that's doing that. 
<laughs> Deputy Director Todd Diefenderfer and Assistant Director and Fiscal Officer Julia Carter for my team for their help and guidance and preparation with our 2022 budget. Our 2022 proposed budget is just a little over $8,607,180. This is the sixth full year for the proposed funding for the Department of Neighborhoods. And the budget includes 52 full-time staff and two part-time student interns. Some of our noteworthy programs and opportunities and items of importance are as follows. We have continued funding in the amount of $2.4 million is included in the department's budget for the neighborhood crisis response initiatives. As part of the mayor's comprehensive neighborhood safety strategy initiative, the department will continue funding through neighborhood crisis response to identify opportunities to address social determinants regarding safety across all of our neighborhoods in the city. The One Linden and Envision Hilltop community plans will continue to guide projects, initiatives, and programs that will advance the priorities identified by the community. Some of these include support for our One Linden School Student Success Initiative, the goal of which is to work with the schools, families, and residents to ensure that Linden is a vibrant, thriving, and safe and welcoming community. Collaborating with our schools allows them to serve as the community hub for this critical work. Through the launch of the One Linden Parent Giver Coalition, Parent Caregiver Coalition in 2021, resources will continue to provide, be provided to both parents, caregivers, as well as children who attend schools in the Linden community. These resources include support groups, workshops, training, and op opportunities to attend community events. We will, attend, we will continue our planning work in the Hilltop as well. Our initial focus will be placed on creating community gathering spaces and increase community pride and engagement within the Hilltop neighborhood. Work will be done to ensure that there is alignment between the Envision Hilltop plan and the work of the Department of Education to develop the new Early Education Center. Support of the My Brother's Keeper program continues to address opportunity gaps for boys and young men of color in our community, as well as the impact of community trauma, and is funded at $72,800. Funding for the New Americans program also continues in 2022 to assist with assimilation of our New Americans arriving to Columbus from other countries. Funding for translation and interpretation services are continued in the 22. 2022 budget, ensuring access to city services for all of our residents. The New American Leadership Academy funding will continue in the amount of $50,000. This funding will allow for one new cohort in 2022 and for NALA alumni to expand their engagement in this critical work. Support of the Columbus Neighborhood Community Grant Program will continue in 2022 budget and is budgeted at $20,000. In years past, this program has provided funding for community activities such as our National Night Out, health literacy initiatives, domestic violence prevention, and anti-bullying initiatives. Also in our budget, the Martin Luther King Day Celebration and Black History Month programming will continue. Given the timing of these annual events that happen in January and February, respectively, funding is typically included in the prior fiscal year's operating budget for the following year's programming. For 2022, funding for the Martin Luther King program is reflected in the operating budget program table in, neighborhood and in the neighborhood and agency services category. Also in 2022, we will continue support for our 21 area commissions. This will include the annual allocation of $2,500 for each commission for a total of $52,500, as well as an additional $10,000 for training and other efforts to build awareness and capacity. Training for our area commissions includes, but is not limited to parliamentary procedures, leading civil conversations and valuing differences, and running effective meetings. The 311 Customer Service Center is on track to address approximately 500,000 customer contacts again in 2021. The number of customer contacts has remained steady over the last three years. The team fully staffed with 19 customer service representatives, three leads, and one assistant manager and one center manager for 23 FTEs. We are very excited to share that by the end of the first quarter of 2022, we will 
we hope to be launching our new 311 CRM customer resource management um, program. This has been a citywide team effort. We appreciate the Department of Technology as well as staff in the mayor's office, city council, and each city department who have contributed to every aspect of this important project. And now I'd like to turn it over to Deputy Director Todd Diefenderfer to talk a little bit about um, the new 311 refresh. Cool. Thank you, Director and Council Member. Um, thanks for having us here this evening. I feel like every time I'm in a room like this and take a mask off, I need to share that I did get my booster uh, right before Thanksgiving. So all went well and uh, feeling healthy today. Um, you know, really, this has, as Director William Scott mentioned, this has been a team effort. So I just want to offer my thanks as well to Director Orth. Uh, Rick Wagner, Pam O'Grady, and their team members that are sitting behind us here today, and um, they've just been real instrumental in getting us to this point with the project. You know, when we go live, we're going to have a number of uh, features that are going to be very exciting for our residents to really help them have a better experience as they're uh, engaging with 3 on one online. There's going to be a new uh, mobile application and a website. They're going to, so a more modern uh, experience and feel for, for our residents there. There's going to be a pin drop feature, so as residents have an issue, potentially like in an alleyway or in the middle of an intersection where you can't quite tell what that address is, they'll be able to drop that pin right on that address so we know we can get the service right where it's needed. There will be new uh, knowledge base articles or information articles available online, so residents will be able to have some more self-service ability to learn more about city services that are available to them. Excuse me. Um, Residents are going to be able to opt in for email alerts or push notifications on the status of their service request. So that'll be able to help them keep up to date that much more easily what's going on. Um, the system will also be able to flag potential duplicates. So, you know, often we see you get a block watch or residents see there's a high grass issue in their neighborhood and multiple people will submit a, that service request there. With this system, that will flag that, people will be able to link their requests together, and the benefit will be, one, the city departments know that multiple people are looking at this and concerned about it, but then also every resident who submits their request is going to get the same information back about the status of that request. And I know we often hear from residents who are concerned that they submit a duplicate and they just get a duplicate closed or some kind of a message like that. In this case, they'll really know what, what happened, what the resolution is on that. Um, in addition, since we really, you know, we have this new app, the new website, we're putting some pieces in place on in each service request. So when people are submitting their requests, they can do it a bit more accurately to ensure that that request is received by the team and routed correctly and quickly to the appropriate department for, for resolution. So glad to take any barriers out there from kind of getting that submitted uh, and to the finish line. So definitely uh, look forward to sharing more information with the community as we get closer uh, to the end of second quarter of next year. Director. Thank you, Todd. And just a few other items. Um, we appreciate City Council's leadership to approve a comprehensive update to the City of Columbus Civil Rights Code earlier this year. The Department of Neighborhoods continues to have one full-time investigator to address form formal and informal complaints of discrimination to the Community Relations Commission. We believe that we are, if not the only, one of the only um, cities in Ohio that have a full-time staff person dedicated to this work. We are working closely with members of the Community Relations Commission to develop and implement a plan to educate, and educate the community about the updated code next year. We had started that process and then um, when the area commission meetings and a lot of our community meetings went virtual, we put a halt to that. But our proposed 2022 budget will make funding available to support this and other efforts to educate our residents about the services provided by the Depart Department of Neighborhoods. And finally, our 2022 budget includes an expansion request to move three CDBG funded staff off the federal block grant to the general fund for a total of $295,625. There are no additional positions that we were created as a result of this expansion request. 
And with that, Council Member Dorans, that is all we have. Um, and thank you for allowing us to share some highlights from our 22 proposed budget. And we are happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Director. Uh, we also did not have any um, speaker slips for uh, your department either for uh, public testimony or questions. So I'm just going to dive into a, a few that I have. And uh, Director, I'm going to direct them to you. And if you uh, would like to throw them to somebody on your team, I will leave that to your prerogative. Um, so first, um, I, and I think you touched on this in, in some of your comments, but uh, the proposed budget includes uh, three additional full-time employees for the neighborhood pride centers. We wanted you to sort of underline a little bit and talk a little bit about like what those folks will be doing, why that's important. Um, so we're talking about you know, adding full-time folks to the staff. Um, just want people in the community to understand a little bit more about what, what that funding is going to do, what, the, what those roles are going to be. Mm -hmm. So actually, thank you, Council Member. Um, those are not new positions. They are positions that were um, moved from the Community Development Block Grant funding. Um, CDBG administrative guidelines require that funds be used in areas of greater need. And as we assessed our staffing assignments um, to ensure equity among our team, then um, all of our team members were not working in particular communities of great need. And so to um, ensure that we were following the guidelines of CDB, uh, the CDBG um, uh, administrative guidelines, we requested to move them to the general fund. Thank and you. And so, yeah, those are our neighborhood liaisons that are in our pride centers. Thanks. I, it's always a fun acronym to try and get out multiple times. <laughs> CD, yeah. <laughs> um, so in, I guess I'll follow up on that. I mean, one thing when we do talk about CDGB uh, funded positions, there's some uncertainty about how that, the long-term sustainability of those things. So again, as you've talked about the, you know, the Department of Neighborhoods is one of, obviously the, the newest department for the city, um, actually charting out what that um, sort of long-term foundation for the department is, just moving those folks over to, you know, uh, again, operating budget dollars, from my perspective, helps to make sure that those positions are, um, they were permanent before, but they're more thought of as sort of the way that uh, we sort of structure things moving forward. Is that, is that fair to say? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Um, you also touched on the neighborhood crisis response program, and I think this is something, you know, we had the public safety budget hearing right before this, and there was a number of folks um, that were um, from the public that were asking questions and, and providing testimony on, you know, alternative methods um, to responding to, you know, safety issues within the community that um, either have, you know, no, no law enforcement involvement or a different type of law enforcement involvement. I know one of the things the Department of Neighbors, Department of Neighbors has done with these funds before is really taking a look at what programs exist within the community, both in the sort of short, medium, and long term, um, to be thoughtful about how you're sort of disrupting drivers of violence within the community and, and also just promoting family stability and economic stability. Um, you know, the, this budget has $2.4 million for that initiative. So I want to know if you could talk a little bit more, more about, you know, sort of past um, ways that that funding has been used in the past and certainly what the sort of plan is moving forward as, you know, we've experienced, you know, unfortunately a significant amount of, of violence in the city and a significant amounts of youth violence in the city. And I know when the department talks about whether it's My Brother's Keeper or other initiatives, I know that is a central focus of yours and the department's. And I wanted to give a little bit of an opportunity to talk about, you know, what that funding does and how, you know, the department's philosophy is on identifying ways to use, use those funds uh, to disrupt some of those drivers of violence in Columbus. Absolutely. Thank you, Council Member. Um, with neighborhood crisis response, we actually try to look at um, several different opportunities um, to address crime and violence in our community. The first would be through the built environment and what's in the neighborhood. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, we look at alley cleanups. Are there lights out? Are there overgrown trees that need to be trimmed back that we can help um, provide funding for? But more recently, what we've used the funding for is to look at um, providing uh, housing stabilization, after school programming, and summer and youth um, employment and youth anti violence initiatives. And we, we use this as an opportunity to work with some of our trusted community partners, some of those to that where we could work with some of those smaller organizations that may not have always had the capacity to receive city or government funding. And so some of the our trusted partners who have already been in that space served as the fiscal agent for these organizations, which then allowed them to do what they do best is provide that um, community engagement and, um, and programming in our neighborhoods. 
Thank you. I was uh, at OSU's law school a few nights ago talking with a, a group of students who was uh, there. The class was literally called Reimagining Public Safety, and it was sort of focused on an entire semester on different things that communities can do to, again, reimagine the way that uh, public safety is delivered. And um, I, th I think the Department of Neighborhoods has an interesting role to play here in Columbus. Um, and we'll talk about, you know, what we call public safety, you know, we, Probably three years ago, we wouldn't call a lot of the work that the Department of Neighborhoods does public safety, but it is. I mean, it is about, you know, preventing violence and certainly helping communities recover that have experienced violence. So just wanted to, to give you an opportunity to talk about what that budget actually it, you know, means out in the community. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other, um, you know, issues that uh, we are experiencing in Columbus and will experience, you know, we have a have already had a number of Afghan refugees arrive in Columbus. And. Uh, Columbus is known as a welcoming community and uh, one that has really tried to build its new American infrastructure to be welcoming and provide economic and social support for, mm -hmm. for folks that arrive. Obviously, you've mentioned the, the New American Leadership Academy, um, which is a wonderful program that, again, helps to find community leaders and ingratiate them with the, with the city and help them be sort of ambassadors for, for their communities. Um, wanted to allow you to either expand a little bit more about, about NALA or about, you know, sort of the um, plans or thoughts around, you know, any budget requirements that you think uh, either exist within this budget or you think should exist within this budget, anticipating, you know, those additional Afghan refugees arriving in Columbus. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, um, we've actually been working with um, some of our colleagues in council as well as um, the our, our refugee and resettlement agencies that have already began pre begun preparing for uh, some of the ref African families that will be settling in Columbus. One of the first things we did was to reach out to them. And, you know, we know we, st we are still in the middle of a global pandemic. And we wanted to make sure that when folks got to our community, they had some of the resources that they needed. And so we were able to provide some funding to both uh, Chris and us together and for them to purchase uh, PPE. E, um, so that they can prepare kits and have things for the families when they get here and get settled. And so that was one of the first things that we've did, we've done. We're also working through our interpretation and translation contracts to make sure that uh, documents that we have that explain basic city services and how to access them, that those are translated in languages that are um, the, that our new residents uh, will be able to understand and to utilize. And then it's also that our it's been our understanding shared that's been shared with us by our resettlement agency organizations that a lot of these individuals that will be settling in Columbus may not necessarily be in Columbus proper that may be in some of our first tier suburbs or other municipalities around um, the Columbus community. So we're working with our colleagues at Franklin County, um, you know, since they will be outside of the county, but we still want to make sure that we're able to support these residents, um, you know, as they settle here. So we will know more. Um, it's, it's, interest, it's an interesting process because it happens. You, the, our resettlement agencies get the information and then just like that, families can start coming, then it might slow down then they might start again. Um, but we've offered to be able to uh, provide whatever resources that they think they might need. Thank you. And again, uh, sort of getting back to the New Americans Leadership Academy, you mentioned um, funding for more involvement with sort of the alumni of that group. And how many cohorts have we had at this point? Is it four or five? Five. five. I think we're on five. Um, so just want to talk a little bit more about, you know, these are you know, new Americans um, that, again, are generally community leaders within, you know, um, you know, parts of the city and certainly different ethnic groups that, that are here and, and, and faith groups. Um, I want to give, give you an opportunity to talk a little bit more about, like, engaging that alumni network and how that um, the department's planning to do that. Because I know every time that I've been at one of those graduations, there's um, a lot of eagerness <laughs> about continuing to uh, be engaged with the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's an exciting thing. And I know this is a, a budget hearing, so we talk about how does that translate to sort of dollars for the department to do these kinds of things. But I think it's important to highlight some of the sort of human interactions that, that go into what those dollars pay for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for those um, folks that may be watching that aren't familiar with what um, NALA is, our New American Leadership Academy, um, we go, our folks go through a nine-month training on um, everything from 
understanding city services, understanding government, working with nonprofits, um, understanding differences. There, there are several trainings that they go through. And our focus was to ensure that we had um, individuals that could then serve on our area commissions and civic associations so that our community organizations would reflect the rich diversity that is Columbus. And so we have we are finally beginning to see that as people have gone through the NALA program and now they feel that they're ready to uh, serve on area commissions. And we have several of our um, former um, participants that have that are now serving on area commissions. But one of the things we did notice is that there was an op there was a this um, energy around the group of wanting to stay together and to do things to stay engaged. And so we began thinking about how we could keep them engaged. And so we've talked about several different things, um, you know, from talking about, you know, how do you get jobs at the city? How do you, understanding the civil service process? Um, this year, the group, uh, their group project, they did an information education session around COVID. Um, for new American communities and passed out PPE and had a food drive. And so all these kinds of different things that allow people to get together. Unfortunately, the pandemic has kind of slowed um, the, our ability to be able to do a lot of in-person things. But our hope is that, keeping our fingers crossed, that hopefully in 2022 we'll take, um, be able to turn the corner on, on this pandemic and be able to do more in-person things and begin to really get our um, alumni folks involved in city government, county government, and other aspects. We even had a couple that, um, uh, one individual that ran for office um, in one of our local races. So just ensuring that in all aspects of community and civic engagement, um, these, you know, it reflects what our community actually looks like. Thank you, Director. And I think energy is the right descriptor for uh, <laughs> the feeling in that room of, of folks that want to continue to to be engaged with the city as as they went through that program. It's always very cool to to see the folks at the beginning of the program and everyone's a, a little bit reserved, and then at the end, it's it's like everyone's one big happy family that uh, again does not want to does not want to leave one another. So it's, it's, that's are, always been very are. cool to watch. <laughs> Um, Director, my, my last question is about the Area Commission. So one of the things that I've been very focused on during my time in council is finding ways to, to empower the Area Commissions. I know um, that is one of the central focuses of the department is to make sure that our, our Area Commissions are um, you know, doing the work that the, the Columbus City Code asks of them, but also provides them with the resource to do a lot of the other things that the, the commissions you know, work on in our neighborhoods. I know you mentioned you know, we have over $60,000 uh, in this budget for support for the Area Commissions. Um, you know, we've, we've in increased that over the years and um, we just wanted to sort of ask a you know, broad question about you know, whether or not, you know, when we talk about the, the support that they've gotten, if there's any you know, thoughts from the department from a budgetary standpoint, you know, we, we know we, we provided a technology grant last year from council to help, especially as a lot of these things were online and virtual, um, just the kind of financial support that um, you think that the, the commission's need sort of moving forward. Um, how, how that money has been spent, you know, obviously individually the, the commissions themselves are able to make some determination how those, those funds have been spent, but um, just want to ask it sort of a broad question because we want to make sure that, you know, they have the resources to, um, to do their job, but also be thoughtful about uh, if, if, those, if, if we need to think about how much those resources are being provided. Uh, thank you. And I, I don't mean to throw on the spot, but I'm going to add, um, ask Julia to help uh, with this because part of the challenges um, is council member. I don't know. I don't think it's the amount of funding they get, but it's the restriction on the dollars and what they can utilize the dollars for. So I'm going to ask Julia if she can share just kind of what that is that they can actually use their funding for. And then I'll share with you some of the things that they've asked to have funding for that they're not able to use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, huh? doesn't bend. Oh, it doesn't bend. <laughs> you bend uh, toward it. <laughs> uh, thank you, um, Council uh, Member Dorrance, for asking that question. Um, we do get asked this question a lot from our area commissions. Uh, it's been well over 10 years since we've revised the eligibility, and that's one of the things that we're going to take a look at in 2022 mm -hmm. um, in partnership with our city auditor's office to figure out what flexibility we have based on the city charter to expand those eligibility uses of the funding. 
Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And just, uh, I, I guess, um, to talk about that, I know there's obviously interest in a charter review commission coming up for a variety of reasons. And if we need to address some of those things uh, at that point, I think it's a, a prime time to do that. Because I know that's one thing that I, every time I go to an, an area commission hearing or a meeting, uh, inevitably funding comes up at some point. And again, that, that question of you know what they can spend it on and sort yeah. of the restrictions around it. Um, because again, I think to your point, director, you know, e even increasing that amount right now, um, they may not even be able to spend whatever increase that we would provide them. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. I appreciate that, assistant director. Mm -hmm. We need to be thoughtful about that heading into this year, and it's probably a, a great time for us to be doing that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, those are all the questions I have, assistant director. I don't know if you have any closing uh, statements or anything you'd like to make at this time. Just thank you for allowing us the opportunity to present and to share with you the awesome things that we're doing in the Department of Neighborhoods. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Director, and mm -hmm. thank you to the team. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially um, when we talk about the area commissions, uh, we asked a lot of them this past year uh, doing things a lot of different ways that people were not comfortable with, which meant that your team was also working with those folks to try new things, which I know is not easy at all times. So thank you to your team as well for working with a bunch of folks that we asked a lot of, and which meant we asked a lot of your team as well. So uh, appreciate you. You all doing that to make sure that, again, the, the ACs were up and functioning and then able to actually help council with our work, too. So thank, thank you for that. You. I will say, uh, council member, thank you as well. Um, the, the technology grants and some of the, the a lot of the area commissions this year used a lot of their fun, used some of their funding to purchase Zoom memberships and um, licenses so that or something so that they could have more secure mm -hmm. meetings um, virtually. And so that was one of the things that was out of the out of the norm for what we had done, yeah. but needed because of the time that we were in. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, now I'd like to move to the Technology Committee. So uh, here with us this evening, we have uh, Director Sam Orth, and I think we've got the uh, most of the uh, the C-suite from the Technology Department. So that's great, great for everyone to be here. Uh, so we have uh, Deputy Director Pam O'Grady, Deputy Director Rick Wagner, and Assistant Director Ehab Tadros. So um, appreciate you all being here. And again, when we talk about how city government has worked over the past two years, uh, if folks thought the Department of, Pe Department of Technology was important before the pandemic, they know now it is very important. So when we talk about uh, an operating budget to make sure that the city can continue to provide services to, to its residents, uh, continue to function, um, that's where you all come in as we're all trying to figure out how to navigate um, again, providing services to our community while doing, uh, doing that as safely as we possibly can. So with that, Director, I'd love to turn the floor over to you to, for your presentation on your 2022 proposed budget. Well, good evening, Chairman Dorans, and thank you for that warm introduction uh, about our department and its role during the pandemic and in city government. And also thanks to President Harden and President Pro Tem Brown and everyone on council for giving us the opportunity this evening uh, to share the Department of Technology's uh, budget for 2022. As you indicated, I'm joined by my colleagues uh, at DOT to my right. And I have to just start by saying it's great to be here in Chambers. Uh, it's the first time in a long time, and it's great to be back. Good to have you in Chambers. <laughs> great, great to be back in this room, and I uh, really appreciate being here. It's been a really long time. And, you know, as you really indicated, um, it certainly it's not been normal times uh, for anyone here in the city since March of last year, uh, and DOT's been no different. Uh, last year, our focus uh, rapidly shifted to respond to the pandemic. And this year, while we've, we've we recovered from the pandemic from a technology point of view, uh, and we started to shift back to some of the ongoing projects and work that we were doing pre-pandemic, like 311 as an example, um, we also continue to be busy building out uh, more permanent infrastructure to support remote telework for city staff um, that will be available well into the future. And, and I, I think it goes without saying, but I, I don't think any of us expected the pandemic to last this long, and we don't know what's going to happen from here. So that, that future cap that capability we're building out uh, we think is really important going forward. Tonight we'd like to just touch on some of the work of the staff of the department in the last year and to share with you some of the priorities that um, we're gonna be focusing on uh, going forward into 2022. And then we'll end with um, a, just a brief overview of our 2022 budget. Um, we always like to start and remind everyone of what we think our role and mission is. And first and foremost, we see that as enabling other city departments uh, to achieve their goals in serving the citizens of Columbus, 
Our primary mission is supporting agencies across the city and using technology to serve citizens, res residents, and businesses of Columbus and Central Ohio. Uh, the department provides support for 12 essential uh, services, such as uh, the city's network, te uh, t telephones or telecommunications, uh, various application programming services, desktop support, IT security, our geographic information service, uh, uh, system, uh, CTV media services, applications that support uh, all city departments like payroll, Acela, 311, Tableau, and citywide email, and then 54 major line of business applications used by various departments in addition to certain technology services to our external customers, in particular the Franklin County Board of Commissioners and Columbus City Schools. And at the center of our work is the continual focus on recognizing that our efforts are successful when our customers say they are, and we call that the pillars of customer satisfaction. And this mission continues to be our focus. It was the, the focus well before the pandemic, during and after, and our job is to serve those around us, and we remain committed to that role. As we mentioned before, our focus remains staying connected with and collaborating with our customers, and we do that by focusing on the four important words, enable, optimize, empower, and modernize. Our primary goal is to enable their success, and that goal couldn't be more relevant than it is right now. Many departments are challenged by uh, having adequate access to staff resources, and technology is a way of helping address their capacity in serving the public. When we work with city departments, we also try to do it in efficient or optimal ways, and we want the solutions we provide to work for them, but also be cost-effective and sustainable over time. And we work to partner with city departments to help them focus on their role of working with the public and our role of supporting them. We've long called that metaphor the, the actor stage crew metaphor, we're the ones, they're the ones on the stage and we're behind them keeping the show going on. Lastly, as we approach services to the city, we're always looking for ways to improve them and that means modernizing vital city systems when we can and you'll hear more about some of that here this evening. Probably the, our best example of the stage crew are the people producing this work, the work we're doing right now and that's Columbus Television and Media Services CTV produces and uh, broadcasts live and streaming media of city events, including city council, uh, including this one right now for the public. So far, CTV this year has produced 513 hours of video content and 120 hours of live programming outside of City Hall. CTV streaming video has seen large increases on both YouTube and Facebook this year, with nearly 3 million minutes consumed between those two platforms. Beyond its normal week-to-week uh, -week programming, CTV has also produced the mayor's virtual State of the City Address, City Council's Black History Month programming, among many more. And CTV is upgrading its video production to be high definition for all the content that it produces. And in 2022, we'll be making an application available for streaming video on home base Roku and Apple TV so that you can watch CTV, for, CTV from your video uh, streaming service at home. And then lastly, CTV is working with Columbus City Schools to broadcast K through 12 educational content for students who want to continue their learning from home. DOT's client computing group has been busy this year focusing on turning the city's remote telework capability created uh, due to the uh, 2020 COVID response to permanent capability to support remote telework well into the future. This includes expanded support for the city's webinar platform we call Cisco WebEx. And we've increased the capacity from 185 users to 1,700 users. And using CARES Act dollars to convert our temporary remote telework solution into a per permanent capability that is hosted in the city's two data centers, that remote telework solution also will increase our security capabilities by adding two-factor remote authentication to our remote telework solution. Our expansion of remote telework also adds remote telephone answering capability for the first time that allows city staff to make and receive 645 city phone calls from the remote computer using a virtual phone we often refer to, refer to as a soft phone. This service, referred to as Cisco Teams, is being piloted by 
Columbus Health, uh, the Auditor's Income Tax Department, and Columbus City Schools, and will be rolled out to the rest of the city this winter and into the new year. Just recently, our client computing group kicked off the replacement of uh, 800 end-of-life computers with city departments uh, by introducing a new customer-facing computer catalog. We're starting that work right now, and we'll be replacing those 800 computers over the many weeks going into the new year. DOT's data analytics and services section works with city departments to use data in innovative ways to make decisions about city programs and to inform the public. Our geographic information system group work with city council to develop maps for council redistricting commission. They also worked with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion to develop a new site to support the 30 by 30 challenge and created a new mapping application that allows the public to receive notification for new zoning requests. Our data management group is working with various city departments to implement new systems that rely on data from other existing city systems. For example, the new payroll system, Dayforce, is integrated with nine other city systems. The data management team is also working with neighborhoods, public service, BZS, and utilities to integrate their workflow management systems with the new 311 platform that will be introduced uh, in next year. And, DP and we're working with DPU to integrate their billing system with, the new, with their new automated metering project using our data integration platform. Lastly, the database management team built or enhanced databases for many critical systems, including systems for BZS, health, public safety, utilities, public service, and many more. Here we go. Our application group manages and maintains applications used by city departments, including the current 311 and income tax platforms. This year, they worked with Health to set up a queuing technology for COVID vaccination registrations earlier this year, and they also upgraded the statistical analysis application that Health uses to track vital health statistics such as tracking COVID and other communicable diseases. Applications also worked with public service to upgrade their work order system we call Lucidy, um, and a major focus of applications in 2022 will be the Go Live of 311 and the new ODI management compliance systems. Applications will also be working with the mayor and stakeholders across the city in 2022 to acquire a new enterprise content management system that is used to manage the city's website, what the public um, knows as Columbus.gov. So major refresh to Columbus.gov in 2022. DOT's infrastructure group provides citywide connectivity to the internet and server and storage hosting solutions for city departments. Well before COVID, infrastructure was implementing several modernization efforts focused on improving the capability and capacity of the city's core IT systems. We're happy to report that in 2021, several of these projects have been completed. The city's primary data center has been brought up to a tier, tier three standard which means that it has redundant generators can function even if one generator were to fail, one of only two or three tier three data centers in the county. The, the completion of our ser server and storage upgrade, what we call hyperconvergence, gives the city the ability to host applications in a private cloud with redundancy in both data centers. This means that if an application is running in one data center and one data center fails, the application will keep running in the other data center, a new capability that the city has never had before. We've also completed the installation of our core network upgrade, including enterprise grade firewalls to protect the city's network. And we're happy to report that we're currently expanding fiber connectivity into all the fire uh, substations and we'll be expanding fiber connectivity to all the recreation and park locations in 2022. And beginning next week, with the approval of City Council, we'll be kicking off a project to replace the network components, including the wireless access in city buildings across the city, starting first right here in City Hall. While DOT is often thought of as running IT systems and services, increasingly our role is expanding to include helping other city departments plan, acquire, build, or implement their most important IT initiatives. DOT's Project Management Office, or PMO, and IT Systems Planning Group 
is help here to help do just that. In 2021, the PMO office worked with 18 city departments and three regional partners on 130 different IT projects. Many include the city's most important and strategic priorities, including the city's COVID response, 311 and supplier diversity adoption, and acquiring a body-worn camera and in-car camera system for public safety. Some of our outreaches help city departments negotiate better outcomes with IT suppliers, leading to measurable cost savings that can be reinvested in other city programs. In 2022, the work of the PMO team won't be slowing down as we shift to planning from implementing new systems for fleet and fuel management, officer wellness, computer-aided dispatch, and records management. The city relies on its IT systems to operate and manage vital city functions that serve the public. Those systems include include critical life safety, health, and financial systems. And unfortunately, like most governments, our systems are subject to attack by bad actors around the globe. Our information security or cybersecurity group plans, assesses, and monitors information technology security and data privacy for city IT service services. So far this year, our team has observed 220 billion events in our monitoring platform that were possible bad acts from these bad actors around the globe. And of those, 161 million connections to those bad actors were blocked. As part of the ongoing, uh, we had a total of uh, 385 suspected security incidents of which we contained or recovered 116. As part of their ongoing work to continually improve our, our security posture, the security team upgraded the city's security monitoring platforms and tools. We also implemented new security standards for IT systems connected to the internet and implemented other guidance on systems access. And, tw and in 2022, we'll be kicking off uh, a first in the city, a citywide cybersecurity risk assessment and an enhanced email security analysis. So we've been, as you indicated, Mr. Chairman, very busy. Um, our uh, 2022 budget uh, reflects a total of $48,401,135. Uh, that request is uh, $4.3 million or 8.15% lower than our 2021 20, adopted budget. Um, of our entire budget, $39.5 million or 82% will be covered by the cost recovery model from other city departments, while $8.9 million or um, 18 percent um, comes, excuse me, uh, is direct charges and is paid by other city agencies. Uh, our 2022 debt page pay payment includes projected bond sales for both the 2021 and 2022 capital improvement budget. And um, we're, uh, our total table of organization is for um, 168 positions, uh, which was also the same number we had in uh, 2021, however, in 2021, we only uh, asked for funding for 168, 66, excuse me. So that's it, Mr. Chairman, uh, unless there's any questions that you have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director. I appreciate the presentation. Um, so we also did not receive any um, speaker slips for questions for the department for your 2022 proposed operating budget. So I'm just going to dive into a few of mine and uh, certainly director, I will send them your way. And if you would like to have anyone on your team uh, handle them, I will leave that to you. Um, so you ended on the on the staffing piece, and that's obviously one of the biggest uh, pieces of any operating budget is staffing. Um, IT professionals, folks that work in your sector, have never been in higher demand than they are right now. Uh, I wanted to ask the question to you, Director, about um, staffing issues within DOT, how um, the, the department is dealing with, again, attracting and retaining talent, uh, and that is a direct budget you know, item, um, and wanted to give an opportunity for you to talk about that because as a city, we, we have very, as I mentioned in my opening comments, very well learned that um, we, cannot, we cannot do a lot of things without a well-functioning Department of Technology, and that has made up the people um, that, that keep the, the, the virtual trains running on time. So I <laughs> uh, wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that staffing piece as it relates to the DOT's budget. 
Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you for that question. It's a really important question. As, as, as much as technology has changed, it still remains a people business. And it's the staff that really plan, the, the staff that really build, the staff that really implement, and the staff that really run these systems that are so critical and vital for, for our government. Um, as you've indicated, um, there, there is a, there's a huge pressure nationally um, on IT staff and other uh, staff, and not just IT folks, but, but IT and, uh, for sure. And we've had really two, a double whammy with COVID. We've had, we've had uh, people retiring, uh, skilled people uh, retiring from the IT profession. Uh, and at the same time, the competition, competition for IT jobs has never been higher, especially here in, in central Ohio, where uh, Columbus is a, uh, 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 one of the top countries in the, in the country, let alone the world, uh, in IT hiring uh, right now. So uh, it, is, it has clearly been a struggle. Uh, it, it has had an impact. We've had some delays with the additional uh, COVID work uh, that we did. We've had some delays in some city projects that maybe wouldn't have happened uh, had COVID not occurred uh, and the staff shortages not occurred. Um, we, it's a major focus in what we do every day. We continue to work to fill those city positions and uh, certainly work with civil service and HR and finance and the mayor's administration uh, to move them forward as fast as we can. But it, it is clearly an ongoing issue, something we're very concerned about and something we have to get up and work on every day because um, the need for the talent is not going to go down in the future. And I, I don't know if there's a specific answer to how we're addressing the problem in there other than to say that we're, we're doing the best we can to attract talent to the city. Thank you, Director. Um, tied up in that um, wind up about how, you know, the past two years have been so different. Um, could you speak to, you know, the major differences that you see in this budget, um, you know, pre-pandemic to where we are now, uh, any significant differences in how DOT is, is spending dollars or ap approaching its work now compared to say it was two or three years ago? Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. I, I, I would just say our, our response would be, would be similar to what you heard earlier from the uh, public utilities. Uh, we are generally seeing just beyond normal operational costs, a large portion of our budget is payroll costs, but the other large components uh, of our operating budget are uh, hardware costs, maintenance costs that are related to the hardware and ongoing software licensing costs. Uh, we do are a fairly large consumer of electricity as utility, as was indicated earlier, uh, utility costs are going up. But in the IT field, a, a particular uh, problem right now worldwide are the, are the supply chain issues related to uh, chip shortages. And it's had impacts not just in the IT industry, but in the automobile industry and other industries that rely on that, sor those so that source of supply. Those IT chips that make all this stuff work are constrained worldwide. And so we are seeing increased costs uh, in the, the hardware costs for all kinds of things, whether they be video cameras or uh, servers, storage, networking devices. But those costs then also uh, are amplified in the maintenance costs because the maintenance costs are a percentage of the original purchase costs. So if the cost of the equipment goes up, the, the cost of the warranty to maintain it also goes up. So we're seeing, we're seeing increased costs in, in maintenance costs and also in software licensing costs. Uh, the software licensing costs and the software companies that make the software, it's mostly people that do that. And with the, with the competition for the talent and an increase in wages for people that write software, the cost of the licensing, which pays those salaries, is also going up. Thank you. It's... Um Interesting to hear, again, a similar answer when you talk about as something as sort of old school as, you know, public utility infrastructure and how those costs are being uh, increased all the way to sort of the 21st century infrastructure, which is the Department of Technology. And um, it's the same thing, just manifested a little bit differently, but certainly drivers when we talk about any budgets, you know, uh, as, as they relate you know, to the upcoming year. So thank you for that. 
Um, one thing that I know the, the department has been focused and is focused on in sort of a prospective uh, kind of way as well is its efforts uh, on cybersecurity, making sure the city is doing everything it possibly can to keep um, our data safe, to make sure that we're operating in a way in which we're not falling victim as other municipalities have to ransomware or other kinds of things. And certainly don't want to get into the details of that, but wanted to allow the department to talk about philosophically how you're approaching that uh, since that is, you know, a, a key part of, of what you're doing now um, to, to keep, keep the city safe. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you for that question. And, you know, I, it probably goes without saying, but it's, it's not an area of the work that we do that's always the most fun, talking about how we're preventing cyber attack. But, you know, it's an important component of our work. And thank you. F you know, uh, certainly know that you value and appreciate that. So really appreciate the question. I, I would say, you know, I kind of alluded to this before, as with all things technology, it starts with the people. And we're really fortunate to have a really dedicated group of cybersecurity staff that get up every day and spend their time monitoring, assessing the city's network for for cyber threats. And as I you know, kind of mentioned in in our budget presentation last year, um, you know, uh, cyber attacks worldwide are at an all time high. They're increasing we, when we think about the amount of commerce that happens now there's more commerce electronically worldwide than there is uh, hand to hand uh, most of the financial transaction worldwide go over over technology services so just in the city alone i uh, just to restate the numbers 221 billion cyber events of which there are 161 million threats and uh, uh, are, are 161 million threats and that were blocked, and then 116 that turned into actual cyber events for the city. So when that occurs, um, we respond initially by assessing whether there was any data loss or impact on our systems. Uh, and then if there are potential things that we have or haven't done, we, we close those gaps uh, in our defenses. And when we, when the those incidents um, include other city departments. We we reach out to them to help them understand what's happened and to get their support and help in, in any changes that they need to make uh, to close them. Um, we certainly will continue to invest in cybersecurity monitoring protection going forward, of course, but we're also expanding our efforts to include the security assessment that I mentioned before which will include the establishment of a common risk management strategy so that the city can maintain visibility of cybersecurity risks and manage them on an ongoing basis. This will help us as a city to identify and address gaps that could, pot could potentially impact things like bond ratings or applications for uh, cyber liability insurance. So we'll be focusing on that in 2022. Um, one area that we are going to focus on in 2022 is what's known as credential uh, phishing. Uh, credential phishing is one of the top threats um, that the city faces. We all face it, uh, even in our personal lives. But attackers are trying to steal city employees' account names and passwords by tricking them into thinking they're logging into a legitimate service uh, or spoofing it, if you will. Once an attacker has a legitimate account name and password, they can log into remote services of the city. We're working on establishing uh, multi-factor authentication for access to the city's network, including uh, remote access. That will be a big uh, step in protecting against that risk. Um, employee awareness uh, is also a really important component, and we're f um, focused on um, working with the uh, uh, human resources and citywide training on uh, a program where we will essentially for um, employees that opt in uh, and departments that opt in, we'll be able to send city originated fake emails as a training mechanism to, to see how staff uh, respond to those fake phishing email attempts as a, as a safety measure and then align uh, that outcome with online training for city staff. And then lastly, we're working with uh, civil service to introduce new cybersecurity positions necessary to attract uh, the necessary knowledge and skills needed 
uh, in the cybersecurity field to protect city assets. So there's a lot packed in there, but thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for that, que for that question. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, last question, and this is a bit of a bit of a softball, probably with too much of a windup. But uh, we've talked a lot about sort of internally what the Department of Technology has has done, um, and how that relates to the budget, and sort of what that looks like moving forward, especially as it relates to the, the pandemic that we've dealt with for the past two years. Um, but externally, you know, the the department has. Uh, really turned its focus uh, to some degree on what it can do on um, digital equity. And this is something that you mentioned earlier, talking about extending fiber to additional city buildings and how that relates. And, um, you know, if, if there's a lot of different organizations, public and private in, in Central Ohio, that are very much focused on, on digital equity and um, how, what that means for, for folks in our community that don't have access to reliable broadband services or the devices to connect to broadband services and uh, wanted to allow the department to, to talk a little bit about um, your role and what the role you've played and are, are, are playing now uh, moving forward uh, as we talk about our own city fiber uh, infrastructure that um, the taxpayers have paid for and that you are now starting to work with folks to leverage, uh, I think, to do some very, very cool things in order to um, get more people connected um, and we know in the 21st century, this is this is absolutely an economic, racial equity issue. So just want to, with that softball uh, question thrown your way, Director, I wonder if you could speak to that. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. It's It's been our honor and privilege to work on this important topic in our community for the last year. And as you've indicated, it really is one of the few outwardly facing things that we do, but it's a really important component of the work uh, here in the city. Uh, and as you know, uh, the mayor made digital inclusion and the digital divide an important topic going back to 2018 in the city of, state of the city address. And, you know, little, little did we really know at that time that the worldwide pandemic would exacerbate the problem on such a large scale, including right here in Columbus and in Franklin County. And uh, while there are no uh, exact numbers on the number of households in our community that don't have Internet access, we think a starting point of the conversation in our opportunity neighborhoods and in the city is that there's as many as 81,000 households, apartments, single family homes, condominiums, where we have residents without internet access. Uh, that's the problem that the, the coalition that you referred to in your, in your remarks uh, that we call the Digital Equity Coalition has uh, been focused on since April last year. Uh, I'm happy to tell you that we continue to report, we continue to meet uh, every week now bi-weekly, but we meet every month and we'll continue to do so well into the future. Uh, so we've come, to, coming together has really just been the beginning in this effort. Um, and since last year, a lot has happened. The coalition's published a digital equity framework and a website. We've established two broadband community pilots on the south side and the near east side. And now we're, we're really looking at long-term solutions that are needed to meet the city's goals of providing connectivity and digital resources to those people that need it the most. Um, the, we've, as a coalition, we've invested in dedicated uh, resources uh, with Smart Columbus as our partner to help the coalition plan in 2022 for community investments and extending the city's fiber uh, and providing device content and community-based support. Um, like many cities, we're reviewing available federal, state, and uh, local funding as potential resources to assist in this work. Um, our expectations of a coalition uh, will be that uh, we'll have an investment plan uh, done by the end of May of 2022 which will position uh, the city and the community uh, for potential federal, state, and local funding, which will start to become available next fall. So there's a lot of work to do in getting ready for that, given the size of the need and the size of the potential investment. Um, I think one main theme that feels really important uh, and central to this effort, and a key learning from the pilots that we really want to share is that from a long-term point of view, our underserved residents and opportunity neighborhoods want what everybody wants. And what everybody wants is reliable, high-speed, affordable, 
let me restate, affordable internet service. And from our point of view, that means we need to invest in fiber to the home. Fiber to the home is the goal and will be instrumental in achieving that goal. Many urban cities across the country and many cities are pursuing that very goal. The good news for Columbus is that our starting point isn't no fiber. It's 1,000 mile fiber network it, which is one of the largest and most robust in the country. So we're not starting from scratch and we're in a better position than most, but it's still going to require a sizable investment given the size of the need. So as you indicated, it's central to our citizens' ability to participate in a knowledge economy. And that's not only important and vital to them, it's also important and vital to the future success of the city of Columbus. So um, we've made a lot of progress. There's a lot of work to do and certainly appreciate your support, uh, Mr. Chairman, as long as, as well as the co your colleagues in city council uh, and look forward to doing that work with you in 2022. Thank you, Director. And certainly with the uh, infrastructure package that was um, passed and signed into law by the Biden administration, we are at an incredibly exciting time for that topic. And I know when we talk about equity and what that means to parts of our community, um, it, it has the potential to be a game changer uh, all across the city. So it is wonderful that that infrastructure is already there and that people have been thoughtful for a long time. And it's even more exciting that there's the investment potentially on the table to, to do exactly what you're talking about. So and it's great to have a team in place that has already been focused on this. And, and again, is looking at it from an equity lens, um, not just any other any other way. So thank you. For, thank you for that. Um, I want to thank, again, all of the department heads and their staff that, that were here tonight to talk about their respective department's budgets. Uh, again, Assistant Director Lee, Director William Scott, and Director Orth, uh, appreciate the uh, work tonight, but also the work year-round uh, in, in um, keeping your departments running, and certainly as it relates to the budget, making sure that we're all being good stewards of, of taxpayer dollars. Uh, I want to thank the members of council staff that have prepared for this hearing today. Uh, John Oswald, Chris Maitland, uh, Matt Erickson, Andy McDonald, and Kevin McCain, as well as uh, James Lewis and Mark Carter and our team at CTV. Um, I hope uh, folks in the community found the information tonight helpful to better understand um, how, again, our tax, tax dollars are being used by these three different departments uh, to deliver city services, make our community a better and more equitable place. Uh, if residents are looking for more information about the proposed 2022 cap or operating budget, uh, you can find that at columbus.gov slash finance. Um, if any members of the public either that are watching tonight or accessing this video later on would like to contact me about any issue we've talked about tonight or anything else, you're welcome to email me at radorns, D-O-R-A-N-S, at columbus.gov. I uh, want to wish everyone a happy and healthy holiday season. Uh, if you have not been vaccinated, please do that. Get your booster. As uh, Deputy Director <laughs> Diefenderfer mentioned earlier, I got mine last week. And uh, certainly more excited about the holiday season now, having uh, that peace of mind to be able to gather with family in a much more safer way. Uh, so I look forward to 2022 and certainly working with uh, city staff on this budget and its eventual passage. Uh, thank you again for everyone who joined us tonight and prepared for it. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.